John Marquis once wrote, the chief obstacle to the progress of the human race is the human race. Today we're focusing on a most significant part of that human race. Americans probably know more about the Middle East uh, than any other foreign policy issue. Our ties to Israel and our role in peacemaking in the Middle East uh, are very important as you know, to us. A few weeks ago, we heard Samuel Lewis, former ambassador to Israel, recount the way in which the historic Camp David Accords <coughs> were reached. Today, we hear from three most distinguished leaders from Portland's Jewish, uh, Christian, uh, and Arab communities who also desire peace in the Middle East. Our three speakers embarked on a fact-finding mission to Israel and uh, occupied Palestine territories in early February, along with others uh, from the area here. The trip, uh, which was sponsored by the Oregon Interreligious Committee for Peace in the Middle East, generated uh, a great deal of controversy uh, because of the per perceived bias uh, of the group. The opposition was such that the Israeli consulate in San Francisco asked uh, that the trip be canceled. We're honored to have Rabbi Stamfer, Frank Afrangi, and the Reverend Rodney Page with us today. Speaking first will be Rabbi Joshua Stamfer of the Congregation Neva Shalom, an executive director of the Institute for Judaic Studies, and I might add a brand new grandfather as of last evening. Rabbi Stamfer was the group leader. Speaking next will be Frank Afrangi, director of the Oregon chapter of the American <coughs> Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee and a resource analyst for uh, Portland General Electric. Closing the prepared part of the program will be the Reverend Rodney Page, executive director of Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon and, and president of the sponsoring group. They will discuss the group's goals, uh, what they saw and learned, how that affected their perceptions and views, and the group's future plans. Uh, welcome first, uh, Rabbi Stanford. Thank you, Phil. Uh, the way we divided our program is that uh, I was to give the background for the trip itself and that Frank Afrangi was to uh, deal with uh, what it is that we saw, observed, and heard on the trip and that uh, Rodney Page would discuss uh, some of the conclusions uh, and uh, inferences that we drew from this trip. Uh, I'd like to uh, begin by indicating, uh, in terms of the background for the trip, uh, the background really goes back to a little over a year ago uh, when uh, I was privileged to attend uh, the national meeting of the Interreligious Committee on Peace in the Middle East, uh, which was organized by Ronald Young. Uh, and I particularly mention this uh, not only because it was after coming back from that trip that we organized our local chapter which sponsored this trip, uh, but I uh, so clearly recall uh, hearing one of the speakers at that conference, Hanna Signora, who is a leader of the Palestinian cause uh, in the West Bank, speaking about his dreams of the future. And that dream consisted of uh, the emergence uh, of a, in, an independent Palestinian state that would be formed uh, in the framework of a confederation with Israel and with Jordan. And he spoke then, using this term, it will be a kind of a Benelux, uh, that kind of a confederation. You can imagine my pleasure in reading uh, in this morning's Oregonian uh, that that exactly is the proposition proposed now by Shimon Peres uh, of Israel. Uh, so it seemed to me that uh, 
to paraphrase a, a slogan, we've come a long ways, baby, <laughs> uh, in the course of this year. To have uh, this kind of a proposal coming from uh, a, a significant a leader, Shimon Peres. And I also want to make reference, before referring to the background of our trip itself, to an article that recently appeared in Parade Magazine just about a week ago that I hope you all read, uh, written by Elie Wiesel, uh, certainly one of the most distinguished Jewish figures in the world. Uh, the title of the article was, Are We Afraid of Peace? And I think that uh, Mr. Wiesel very sensitively reflected uh, the human trait, uh, a trait that I think is the underlying cause for uh, the kind of criticism that uh, our trip was subjected to. There are very many people who are afraid of peace. It's not because they don't want peace. Peace, like uh, proverbial motherhood, is something that everyone wants. Uh, I doubt that we would find a person in the world uh, that isn't an advocate of peace. But the reason that we're afraid of peace, or that many are afraid of peace, is that like any other precious commodity in the world, peace can only be obtained at a price. And we're afraid of paying the price that is necessary for peace. Uh, we, as human beings, are creatures of habit, not only in terms of the way we put on our clothes or tie our shoes, but the way we think. And we fall, fall into patterns of thinking which we find very difficult to change. And when it comes to the Middle East, and for very good reasons indeed, uh, we have all of us, and I certainly can speak as one familiar with the Jewish community, have fallen into patterns of thinking about the Middle East that are very hard to change. Those who are designated as enemies are going to be enemies forever, no matter what they say or no matter what they do, because that's the way we think about them. <laughs> Historical memories become the overriding concerns of our policy making. And when uh, we are the victims of our own habitual patterns of thinking, we find it very difficult and very painful to even conceive of having new ideas about an old situation. Uh, I went to this conference and came back and uh, was very enthusiastic about creating this Committee on Peace in the Middle East and found myself immediately accused uh, of being someone who uh, is reborn, is changed overnight, and therefore untrustworthy. Uh, I like to think of myself as being somewhat trustworthy. But I also like to think of myself as being able to respond to change and to be able to change my way of thinking in response to a change uh, in the political and human conditions. And uh, what I saw and what I came to realize in the course of this past year was that a great change has taken place in the Middle East in the emergence of a Palestinian national movement. For a change, the basic drive of Palestinians was not to destroy Israel, but to create their own state. That was a very positive change, and I feel a change that has within it very real hopes for a solution to the problem of their relations and the achievement of peace between these two people. Our committee, uh, as you will hear more of later, has been very active during this past year, and that there came a time when we felt that it was very important for us to see firsthand what is happening there. Uh, it's not that we don't trust the media. It's not that we don't trust uh, leaders uh, and their uh, messages to us. 
but it's very important for us to be able to see ourselves and to hear ourselves what is happening and what is being said and so we organized this tour and we were determined at the outset of this tour that we were indeed going to hear both sides of the issues and get a balanced picture the problem that I understand uh, in certain circles and uh, Phil alluded to the uh, reaction of the consulate uh, in San Francisco to our trip, the Israeli consul, uh, saying that it was a biased trip and that it should not be undertaken. Uh, I can understand that kind of reaction uh, from someone who finds it very difficult to believe uh, that there can be a non-biased approach. Everything is so black and white uh, in that part of the world. Uh, and it was very difficult uh, to accept that assumption that we were indeed going to hear both sides of the issue. Uh, I went in advance of the group uh, by a week to make all of the arrangements and found the same reaction there. Uh, that uh, the government officials believe that it was impossible to really hear both sides and to be sensitive to both sides because that's not the way any trip had ever been organized before. Uh, I'd venture to say, uh, to my knowledge, there has been no group going there that has exerted those kinds of efforts to really hear both sides of the issue. And we did in a period of eight days we heard an enormous number of lectures and met a great number of personalities from both sides. And the, uh, I think the most satisfying feeling that I had upon returning on our last day there uh, was to hear from the representative of the Israel Foreign Ministry to whom I addressed the question, well now that it's all over and, and you've seen what we've done, what do you think about our trip? And his answer was, I think it was wonderful. And he accepted uh, the fact that we had had this kind of orientation. You'll hear more from Rodney about uh, some of the conclusions that we came with. Uh, but I want to say that I, I was very proud of our group, uh, of their intense response uh, to all of our experiences. And I think we all came back. Uh, much more confused than when we went, uh, confused by knowledge and confused by a broader vision of what the problems are, but much more committed to the possibility of peace. Thank you. I always shiver when I come to the microphone after Rabbi Stanford because I know there is no way I could match his articulation and skill in discussing the subject. But uh, I will try. Usually, uh, I sit back sometimes and, and try to rethink the course that we re -embar uh, embarked on, basically the, our approach to solving the Middle East problem or our belief on how the Middle East problem should be solved. And sometimes I, I go into this deep doubt, is this the correct approach or not? And invariably, we, I always come back to the same conclusion with the help of some friends. The friends are the extremes of both the Arab American community and the Jewish American community. When I see both extremes attacking us, I know we're on the right track. <laughs> if I see one group silent, I know we're too biased towards them. And so far, fortunately, the extremists on both sides have attacked the group's ideas and the group's activities. So I'm, I'm glad to see that. Uh, now, as for the trip, I will, uh, because of the lack of time here, I will try to address two issues very quickly. One the brutality of the occupation, and two, the refreshing views of both Palestinians and Israelis that we met, which gave me a, a, a real 
uh, uh, optimistic feeling uh, on the way back. Uh, first, the brutality of the occupation, and I will not address that to ma make people guilty or upset or uh, to feel bad. The reason I would address that and give several examples is to make sure that I convey the message to you on how crucial the situation is right now in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. At the beginning of our trip, one of the first stops we had was in the West Bank uh, village of Beit Sahur. It's a small Christian village outside the, uh, 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 almost a suburb of the city of Bethlehem. We visited this, uh, the family of a young teenager who was killed when a 50 pound cinder block was dropped on his head from the top of a building where Israeli soldiers were manning an observation post. The official explanation was that the wind blew the cinder block. Now, listening to the family and looking at the posters in the wall, on the wall in the room of that young man, I saw pictures of Rambo and pictures of muscular men and women and so on and so forth. The first thing that went through my mind, I do not believe that this kid was killed without provoking or instigating the action, like throwing stones or doing something. And I, I really had some doubts in my mind about the incident. And I felt, folks, you don't need to exaggerate. The Palestinians have a good cause. Don't go and make this man as a saint who just had a cinder block dropped on his head for no reason whatsoever. By the end of the trip, I was convinced otherwise. All my, my disbeliefs were wiped out. The reason being, I had the fortune of sp spending about four days uh, in the West Bank after the group left uh, at my sister's house. My sister had no reason whatsoever to try to convert me or convince me of, of, of what's going on. So she was relaying to me some actual stories that she saw herself. One of those stories was she was sitting on her porch and she saw the neighbor's kid carrying a, a, a bag of garbage and going crossing the street to put it in a large dumpster. His misfortune was that an Israeli mobile patrol was passing by. They jumped out of the car and continually beat the kid until he had two broken arms and spent a week in the hospital. Now, I could relay many incidents of the such that led me to believe that the occupation has reached a level of, br of brutality that has to be stopped. It's not only affecting the Palestinians, it's affecting the Israeli soldiers' morale as well. These soldiers go home to their families and you cannot be brutal 15 miles from here and come back home and be a nice gentleman. You come home, you become abusive to your wife and children. It's affecting Israel economically, it's affecting Israel mor morally. I'll, I'll end this segment by saying, by quoting a young lady in the West Bank uh, uh, that really impressed me. When talking to her about this subject, about throwing rocks and, and, and throwing uh, Molotov cocktails and so on and so forth, she said, we knew from the beginning that in our uprising, in throwing rocks and throwing Molotov cocktails, we're not going to be able to dislodge the Israeli army from our towns and cities. What we are doing, the reason those 400 young men and women are dead right now, thousands or tens of thousands of them are maimed, paraplegics, quadriplegics, and so on and so forth from, from beatings and whatsoever, is because they wanted to send the world a message, and specifically you folks in the United States a message. They paid for it by their lives and their futures. And that message is, we cannot tolerate the occupation anymore. We are ready to die so that we send you this message. And if you don't get this message, our lives were wasted in vain. On the second subject, which I think gave me the glimmer of hope, is the multitude of Israelis and Palestinians that we met that are seeking coexistence and peace. For example, I was super impressed, I did not know before I leave, that there was 
60 different organizations within Israel's proper that are fighting for peace. Some of them are Yesh Gavul, called Yesh Gavul. There are military so, uh, units, soldiers, that the meaning of Yesh Gavul is there is a limit. They feel there is a limit to what's going on. It has to end. There is no military solution. There has to be a political solution. Those folks refuse to serve in the army in the occupied territories. Others, like the black uh, women in black, are all mothers, Israeli mothers, that dress in black every Friday and demonstrate in the three major cities of Israel. One of their demonstrations places, spots is the, in front of the offices of Prime Minister Shamir. So many, many people within Israel are unhappy about the occupation, are ready to coexist with the Palestinian people uh, in two different states. On the Palestinian side, I was super impressed in private talks with refugees, by the way, and young people who are the true leaders of the Palestinian movement right now, all the leadership that traditionally used to be there, the notables and the patriarchal uh, traditional society is all shattered. Now the leaders are from the cross, across the section of all the society. Those people I met, and I would ask them point blank, in private, Palestinian to Palestinian, are you willing and ready to accept Israel within its 1948 boundaries and coexist with it in peace if they move out of here? Or are you going to ask for Haifa and Jaffa and Tel Aviv? And the answer invariably came, we are absolutely ready to coexist in peace with what they refer to as our cousins in two different states. Whether they were in the refugee camps that came from Haifa and Jaffa and, and Ashkelon and so on and so forth, or whether they were city dwellers in middle class suburbs. I asked them the second question. Second question, why do you keep saying we want to go back to Haifa. We want the, the people who were thrown out of there to go, the right to go back there, the right for compensation. And the answer came, as long as there is people in Israel, like the settlers, who say we want to be present at the Jordan Valley, in Nablus, in Hebron, we will continue to say that we want to be in Haifa and Jaffa and Tel Aviv. So the point is that the extremists on both sides sometimes inflame the passions of the majority of the population to get them almost blinded uh, uh, with, with passion and, and decrease uh, the chances for a solution. Now, something happened yesterday that really caught my, my attention. I heard Rabbi Rose speak uh, at a uh, presentation by the World Affairs Council. In his presentation, he said yesterday, he would like to prophesy for a minute. And his prophecy was that he would he hope to see the Bellanex type of situation, a state where uh, there is an economic confederation between Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. And it was funny, and at the same time, a very happy point, because when we were in the West Bank, and we were talking to the top PLO supporter, Faisal Husseini, who was jailed many times, who the Israeli leaders are holding talks with, mm -hmm. said exactly the same thing. And I felt, by God, the miracle had happened. All, all sides agree on something. So maybe finally we'll, we'll get a s to see a real movement towards peace, because it seems like the focus is narrowing and the solution is close at hand. Thank you. I must express appreciation to the Portland City Club on high noon on Good Friday, one of the holiest days of the Christian calendar, to bring together a Muslim, a Jew, and a Christian to talk about peace in the Middle East. I just hope during the question and answer period there not be another crucifixion, <laughs> however. <laughs> the Oregon Interreligious Committee for Peace in the Middle East is composed of Jews, Muslims, and Christians who are dedicated to three things. One. A, a safe and secure borders for the state of Israel to an independent Palestinian state composed of the West Bank and Gaza Strip that's demilitarized, and three, the need for an international peace conference. 
composed of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council and also the PLO and Israel. During the time that we were there in Israel, we visited with uh, leadership of the PLO, we visited with uh, people from the Knesset. Uh, we went from 7.30 in the morning till 10.30 in the evening. We were in a variety of different situations. And I think all of us, even though we went there with a predisposition towards those three things, came away more convinced than ever before that that position is correct. We're, we're not saying this, though, out of any sense of Israel bashing or anything else. I want you to know that Rabbi Stamford was born and raised in Israel. He fought in the Haganah, he, in, in Israel's War of Independence. He served as a rabbi of a synagogue in Jerusalem. He, his son and daughter-in-law and grandchildren live in Jerusalem, teach at Hebrew University. He does this because of a love. I do this out of a love for Israel. I'm co-founder of the Oregon uh, Jewish Christian Association. I've led groups to Israel of Christian ministers. We do this out of a love and concern for the continuation and preservation of the state of Israel. Where do we go from here? Some of the things that we saw were not too pleasant. Uh, Frank has alluded to some of the, uh, uh, what is happening in the Intifada. There have been over 500 deaths since the uprising, the Intifada. 46,000 serious injuries, 10% because of, of shootings, 45% because of beatings, 30% because of tear gases. And when they say they fire uh, uh, rubber bullets at people, I want you to know this is one of the projectiles. It's a steel bullet with a thin coating of rubber that has caused death and serious injury to hundreds of people. There has been 5,000 administrative detentions, people that can be kept up to six months in prison without any kind of, of release. There have been 2,000 days of closure and sieges when, around refugee camps. And there are thousands upon thousands of people living in these refugee camps. We visited them, you saw and, and read about them uh, in the uh, or series of Greg Noakes in the Oregonian. And uh, it's a wonder to me that there hasn't been greater uprisings uh, heretofore when you have 50 and 60 percent unemployment in these refugee camps crowded in grinding poverty. It is amazing to me if this was in the United States, there would certainly be much more kind of an uprising. There have been 100,000 uprooted olive trees and fruit trees uh, because of punishment by the army. There have been 600 uh, demolitions. By that, if a person is uh, suspected or caught by th of throwing stones, they go in with bulldozers and bulldoze down a house uh, and, uh, and all the uh, possessions of the uh, persons. 5,000 people have been displaced because of the Intifada, and there have been 30,000 people arrested. What can we do um, to try to bring Israel to the peace table and to conversations and dialogue with the PLO? One thing should be remembered is that the United States gives Israel some $3 billion a year in economic and military aid. There is an addition to that of 450 million that is lent by individuals and institutions to Israel through uh, bonds. An additional 350 million is just outright given through the United Jewish Appeal for a yearly contribution of $4 billion, which represents about 12% of Israel's 33 billion uh, gross national product. We can begin to be put pressure on uh, our government to put pressure upon the Israeli government to come to the negotiating table. It is because of pressure in the past, in the last few months, that I believe Israel is now beginning, the Likud party, uh, Shamir and others are beginning to talk about the possibility of conversations with the Palestinians. And when we say about Palestinians, we should remember that we're not just talking about Muslims, but thousands upon thousands of Christians as well. 35,000 Christians exist, live in the West Bank and the Gaza. In addition to that, there are thousands of others 
uh, who live in uh, Israel proper. Frank alluded to the fact that there was uh, numbers of people uh, involved in the peace movement. There are 67 peace movements to be exact, although that was a, a few weeks ago. There's one almost being born every moment. While we were there, Clergy for Peace was born, and we met with some of the leaders of Clergy for Peace. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there are a number of other um, peace movements composed of Muslims, Jews, and Christians. One thing I think we were all struck by the fact that there is such an insularity of the groups. By that, there is little conversation, dialogue, intercourse that takes place between Jews and Muslims and Christians. There is a Jewish settlement. There is a Christian village. There is an Arab village and so forth. Uh, Arab boys and girls go to Arab schools. Jewish boys and girls go to Jewish schools. And never the twain shall hardly meet, except on a very peripheral basis. We visited Gavit Haviva, which was an experimentation, an institute to bring together Arab young people and Jewish young people to an encounter exposure, three-day and five-day dialogical uh, kinds of e exposures to get to know one another and appreciate one another's problems and issues and concerns and to really to get to play together and recreation and sing and dance and be together and they've done attitudinal studies about this and shown uh, that uh, attitudinal studies before during and after and shown because of experimentations like this there's a greater a much greater understanding of uh, one another's problems and issues we visited Neve Shalom, Fields of Peace, uh, fa uh, started by Father Bruno, an attempt to bring together Arab families and Jewish families because he had a vision by God to bring together Arab families and Jewish families who could live together in peaceful coexistence and work together and be together. It has become a model uh, throughout Israel of how Jews and Muslims can live together and pray together and be together in significant ways. What is the future? What do we aim to strive for and work for as an organization? Uh, we, at the Oregon Interreligious Committee for Peace in the Middle East, have garnered some 2,000 signatures on initiative petitions to present to the Oregon Congressional Delegation, calling for these three things that we espouse. Uh, we are also presenting additional symposiums and uh, information to try to sensitize uh, people and educate them as to some of the problems and issues and concerns uh, uh, operative in that area. And we have also uh, led tours. And in fact, uh, many of the people that were on that tour are here in the audience today. In fact, I'd like them to stand right now and be recognized. Uh, former U.S. attorney, a couple of council generals, three ministers, president-elect of ecumenical ministries, a number of other people who went on that uh, tour. We're planning additional kinds of tours uh, this coming fall. I would like to close this part of our program by reading um, a statement by one of the very high leaders of the PLO. There are many peace movements, small and large, in Israel. To these, I say, in the name of the Palestinian people, the PLO and the Palestinian leadership, to every child in Israel, to every woman and every man, through you that we are genuine in our desire for a strategic peace, a peace through which we shall bring security and stability to this region, a peace in which people can begin to devote their life and time and energy to making their lives prosperous and genuinely peaceful. I'm happy to announce to you, because I've just received word, that we will be bringing to Oregon in August a exhibit of Israeli and Palestinian artists. These two groups who are dedicated to peace in Israel and an exhibit of some of their works of art. And having uh, seen this at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., I can attest it is a very, very moving exhibit. The artists sometimes are much quicker in their sensitivity and ability to lead us than are our politicians and religious leaders. They have come up jointly, the Palestinian and Israeli artists, with this statement, signed in Jerusalem this last June. One, the creation of a sovereign and independent Palestinian state in the territories occupied by Israel since the War of 1967. Two, the sovereign state of Palestine acknowledges and recognizes the right of the state of Israel to live in peace and security. 
Three, the two sovereign states, Israel and Palestine, shall sign a peace treaty and a non-aggression accord between themselves. Four, a demilitarized Jerusalem with open borders in which citizens of both states live together side by side in peace. Five, a just solution will be found to the refugee problem within the framework of the peace treaty. And six, all the stage, stages, processes, and procedures leading to the creation of the state of Palestine will take place under international supervision. We invite your prayers, your concern, your work, so that one day there may be peace in the land that we call holy. Thank you. It is now time for questions. As usual, uh, questions limited to City Club members. We need to remind everyone that we really don't want speeches, we want questions. Uh, the staff will circulate uh, for the written questions, but we will give priority to uh, questions uh, from the floor. You can address your questions to any one of the panelists. Uh, so let's uh, proceed. Who's going to ask the first question? Oh. <laughs> My goodness sakes, thanks for reminding me. Uh, the audience, I got it from the audience before I got it from you, Charlotte. <laughs> Our board host has the honor of asking the first question, Charlotte Kennedy. I was hoping I had the last question, but it doesn't <laughs> turn out that way. I'm going to ask you about your uh, original intention of, of drawing attention and support to the idea of an international conference. Some people would argue that that is not the way to make progress, that having a group of the five permanent members of the Security Council, Israel and the PLO together in a relatively public setting isn't the way to go about reaching an agreement. What was the response to that proposal in Israel and the West Bank? Could you tell us something about uh, how well that was accepted? Well, the, uh, <coughs> in Israel, uh, there is understandably a great deal of skepticism about uh, an international conference. Uh, Israel has been uh, uh, subjected to international conferences in the past with uh, very few good results. Uh, I, re I recall uh, one such conference that was scheduled at Geneva where uh, the substance of the conference uh, was uh, the seating arrangement, and they never really got beyond that. And that's how they view the difficulties of international conferences. And, uh, and as I say, that's quite understandable. Uh, the reason that, uh, that we are supporting the notion of an international conference uh, is that uh, uh, you, have a, uh, you have two uh, parties uh, to the negotiations. Uh, one is, uh, is an occupying force and the other is an occupied population. Uh, and uh, uh, from all that we understand from the Palestinian point of view is that uh, they don't feel that in the context of direct negotiations between these two parties and no uh, international powers present that uh, it would hardly be uh, a, an atmosphere in which a fair negotiations can be carried on. There have been other alternative suggestions of just the two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union acting as the brokers or uh, the, uh, the powers present at an international conference, and that may be uh, a, a better way to go. We're not uh, so totally committed to the idea of the five permanent members of the Security Council, but the, there has to be a direct presence of the, of the, uh, of the great powers uh, who, are, who have uh, uh, real interest in the Middle East uh, in order to guarantee the results of those negotiations. Uh, to have uh, Israel and the Palestinians negotiate with each other uh, puts the Palestinians at such a disadvantage that, uh, that uh, they really can't participate uh, in that kind of a conference. It would be mostly the dictating of terms by one party to the other. Uh, I would imagine that uh, Israel would be uh, inclined to favor that kind of a negotiation. Uh, but I don't think it would be acceptable to the Palestinians and would not lead to a resolution. I think it should be underscored that we're not, uh, again, these proposals or these things, three things that we say that we're uh, putting forth, they're not chiseled in concrete in any way, shape, or form, but they're meant to be uh, talking points. Karen Katz, City Club member. I'll let you negotiate who answers this question. 
Uh, in light of the fact that Israel does not have a constitution or a bill of rights as we know it, what are the prospects for the Palestinian and Arab people who are citizens of Israel should peace be achieved? Go ahead. Could, could you repeat the question one more time? Uh, I'll rephrase it. Um, what are the prospects for the citizens of Israel, the underclass, should peace be achieved when uh, there's, there's not a Bill of Rights, as I understand it, um, in Israel or in Palestine? What, what protection mechanisms will be put in place for the, for the people who are the underclass? Oh, that's a tough one to answer because uh, I, I can't tell you what we heard from Israeli Arabs now. Uh, is that uh, they feel like they are absolutely loyal citizens of the state of Israel. Unfortunately, they feel like a second class citizens, like you mentioned, and that hopefully one of their goals in a peace settlement, that that element of fear within the Jewish Israeli portion of the society will dissipate in a, in a peaceful situation and that will guarantee them all of their rights. As it stands right now, they are looked at as a suspect or a fifth column, if you will, within the Israeli society. And thus, they are discriminated against very heavily with the admission of, of uh, Israeli academicians and, and government people and so on and so forth. For example, an Israeli uh, Arab village gets about one quarter of the funding of an Israeli Jewish village and so on and so forth. Uh, their only hope is that when there is a peaceful solution, all uh, then they can work and I, I, I really qu can't quite answer your questions what Israel would do, but o all what they, I can say is they hope they will be equal citizens. I think it should be underscored very much that uh, uh, Arab Israelis do feel very much like second class citizens and discriminated against up until just a few years ago for every $13 uh, that the gov government support to uh, a Jewish village, one dollar went for an Arab village. That's been changed uh, in the last couple of years to one to four. For every four dollars going to in an Israeli settlement, one dollar now goes to uh, the Arab village. But when we have that kind of uh, feeling that the, the Arabs are being systematically, intentionally discriminated against and feeling of second class citizenship, um, uh, there, I think it, the, the feelings of uh, hatred and animosity are going to uh, continue. Yeah, I'd like to add uh, from another dimension, uh, not, the <laughs> not the money dimension, but uh, Palestinians have uh, frequently been compared to Jews in terms of some of their experiences and responses. And we know in the Jewish world that the creation of the State of Israel has provided Jews living everywhere with a great sense of pride in being what they are. Uh, pride in the achievements of Israel and uh, pride in themselves uh, as, uh, as members of a people uh, that, uh, that shares these traditions with Israel. So uh, it has been uh, a great source of spiritual strength to Jews living everywhere. Uh, I think much of the same can be said of Palestinians. They feel like a very discriminated minority in the Arab world, not just in, in Israel. They haven't been well treated by any Arab nations. Uh, they feel that their identity as Palestinians has been denied both by Israel as well as by the Arab nations and therefore the emergence of a state of Palestine would go a long way to restoring their pride and being what they are and uh, I think would help uh, significantly in the way they look at themselves as they live in Israel and as Frank pointed out as loyal citizens of Israel. Uh, Jews in America feel that we are as loyal citizens of the United States as any group in this country. But we feel uplifted uh, by the identity that we have with the State of Israel. I think Palestinians living as minorities in other countries would be greatly uplifted and strengthened in their inner feelings if there were a State of Palestine with which they could identify their national ideals. Tom Ballmer, City Club member. This is directed to the panel as a whole. Do you believe that there has to be some change in the domestic political situation in Israel before there will be real progress towards peace? 
I'm referring to the, the paralysis and the apparent uh, split that uh, we've seen in recent elections there. Uh, I'd like to have your thoughts on that question. Go ahead. There is a paralysis. Uh, we all recognize it. Uh, there are profound divisions within Israel, and you're probably right uh, that until uh, Israel can uh, take the necessary steps towards peace, uh, that, uh, that division and that paralysis will have to be resolved. Uh, we're hopeful that, uh, that events are, are, are pushing Israel in that direction. There are new voices being raised, uh, certainly on behalf of uh, negotiation with the PLO. Uh, I uh, remarked last night that just two days ago, the leading newspaper in Israel, Haaretz, which is uh, the furthest thing from being a left-wing newspaper, come out publicly for negotiations by Israel with the PLO. So there is a move in that direction, and once the negotiations begin, uh, there's little doubt in my mind that they will lead to that uh, desired for result. And a recent public opinion poll states that 54 percent of the Israeli population believes that the government should enter into dialogue with the PLO now. Paul Simpson, the City Club member. I would like to know what thinking has been done as regards making the a 1948 Palestinian state, a viable economic entity. Reverend Page, would you? Well, I think that I think that you've hit upon a very critical and crucial question. Somewhat it was uh, talked about a little bit at the World Affairs Forum last night, and uh, something that was alluded to by uh, Hannah Sonora and others, and that is a. a, a it is going to be very difficult and that if it is going to succeed at all, uh, it is going to have to have uh, the backing of uh, the United States and there has to be some kind of economic confederation between uh, Jordan and uh, Israel and the new Palestinian state. And if uh, it must have that to be able to succeed. I, I'd just like to add a uh, few things here. Uh, I heard that thrown in my face many, many times. Uh, that state won't be viable. That state is economically will be depressed and dependent on other people and so on and so forth. The same sort of talk that uh, people used to tell the Jewish people when they were trying to establish the state of Israel, for one. Two, you're looking at uh, the Palestinian people who uh, have uh, 11 graduates, uh, university graduates per thousand versus uh, France, which has nine, and England, which has 10. Uh, if you look at Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, many of the oil-rich countries, if you go there and check who are the technocrats, who are the Palestine. scientists, who are the doctors, who are the government officials that are running things, it's the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Those expatriates will be sending money, and that's a national resource into that city. We, if, 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 uh, the Palestinians are certainly a very industrial, industrious people, and, and there is no question in my mind that they can start industry within the boundaries of the state. What are the resources of the state of Israel right now, except human skill and, and uh, knowledge of electronics and what have you? So in that sense, that state is extremely viable. Paul Romain, City Club member. Uh, the previous speaker sort of took a question that I wanted to pick up on from last night, but I will go on with a different theme here. Some of us tend to be still fairly skeptical about the viability of a Palestinian state or the establishment of a Palestinian state, although we think what you're doing here is great. Uh, what has, have you given any thought to how you get other Arab nations to join in this process? There are probably probably the people in the Middle East who don't, do not want a, a separate Palestinian state more than the radicals in Israel are the radicals in the Arab states surrounding it. Syria considers the area to be greater Palestine. I noticed Reverend Page had ideas about how to get pressure on Israel, and I keep hearing pressure Israel, pressure Israel, the PLO will come along. How do we pressure Syria? How do we pressure Saudi Arabia? How do we pressure Kuwait? How do we pressure the people who are financing the terrorism to come to the peace table and say, we will live at peace with Jews in the Middle East? 
Well, I think that's, an, that's a very, a very good question, and it raises a very significant issue. Uh, but I, I do want to point out that that issue is present whether or not there is a Palestinian state. In other words, Israel is surrounded by Arab nations uh, who are uh, still determined on its destruction. And uh, the response has been to provide a, a military uh, power to Israel, primarily through, uh, through America, uh, that enables it to resist. In other words, uh, uh, for uh, a full decade now, there have been no attacks against Israel because uh, uh, they simply know that Israel militarily is perfectly able to defend itself. Now, that same kind of umbrella of protection would be provided to Palestine just as it would be provided to Jordan. Uh, Jordan is also uh, the, uh, the, the obvious victim of aggression on the part of Syria, for example, or on the part of Iraq. Uh, so uh, the answer is that uh, uh, if the United States uh, is committing itself to peace in the Middle East, then it commits itself, just as it did in the, uh, uh, the Gulf War, by sending in, uh, when they sent in the battleships there, it commits itself uh, by military support uh, to assure the, uh, the continued survival of the states that it recognizes in the Middle East. So you're, uh, certainly that's a real problem, but what I'm saying is that problem is inherent in the Middle East, in the, uh, and we have been able uh, to maintain uh, uh, the, uh, the Middle East uh, through our support. And I'd simply like to point out further that with the new direction that the Soviet Union is taking, that the United States task is made a great deal easier. If the Soviet Union has indeed turned around uh, and begins to truly work for peace, as there are every indications, uh, then uh, that problem should be far more easily met than it has been in the past. But if all that remains to be seen. If I may take just a short swipe at this. Uh, what is Saudi Arab Arabia's problem with Israel? It's the Palestinian issue. What is the Iraqi problem with Israel? It's the Palestinian issue. Give me any other reason why, you may believe differently, but the reason those countries have a problem with Israel is because of the Palestinian issue. Once the Palestinian issue is resolved, there is no reason why those countries cannot recognize Israel and cooperate with Israel. For one, I was reading a couple of days ago that Israel sells $600 million worth of products in the Arab countries right now under European names. Mm -hmm. Jordan has, for all practical purposes, econo an economic trade partner. The only exception maybe is Syria because of its territorial problems on the Golan Heights. Otherwise, the totality of the Arab country's problem with Israel is the Palestinian issue, and I'm convinced of that, and reading history can prove that. Ray Polani, a member of the City Club. Uh, Rabbi Stamper, I, I think you have kind of begun to answer my question, and that is really what is the role of the Soviet Union in this situation? And of course, to begin with, is there a role, and I think we probably recognize that there is, but what is the role? of the Soviet Union in the solution of the problem. I think there's been some beginning. Uh, we know a change of relationship with us, and I guess a change of relationship with Israel, too, it appears. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I th uh, felt all along uh, in so many other uh, 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 areas that uh, it's important to recognize change when change occurs. The role of the Soviet Union in the past has been a, a very uh, confrontative role as far as Israel is concerned. Uh, the Soviet Union has not only armed, but has stimulated uh, the, the violence in, in, the, in the Middle East. Uh, uh, I recall so vividly in 1967 what the role of the Soviet Union was in, uh, in, in uh, fostering the attacks on Israel, particularly by Syria. Uh, that had been the role of the Soviet Union, uh, very anti-Israel and, uh, and, and very much encouraging of military conflicts in the Middle East. It seems, uh, as in so many other areas, that the role of the Soviet Union is changing. 
uh, with their withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, with their stance on, uh, on uh, nuclear arms as well as conventional arms. Uh, it, it seems that uh, there is a growing understanding in the leadership of the Soviet Union uh, that uh, their primary task is to is to improve the economy and well-being of the Soviet Union and not to foster war. Uh, and uh, if that change is a real one, and uh, our, our administration is, uh, is slowly uh, moving uh, uh, with, with that understanding, that is, they, they want to wait and see uh, as we gradually move in that direction, whether indeed that's a, a, a uh, basic change in the Soviet Union policy. But if it is, uh, then it means that the Middle East will no longer be the arena uh, in, in which uh, confrontation is sponsored and fostered by the Soviet Union, which will go a long, long ways in enabling uh, a resolution of the problem between Israel and the Arab nations. Uh, I, I do want to add a disagreement with my uh, friend and partner here. I don't think uh, that the Palestinian issue is the, is the only reason why the Arab states have been so anti-Israel. Because when there was no Palestinian issue, they still uh, were uh, very anti-Israel. And um, uh, I haven't seen a real change in their point of view. I, I certainly agree that if the Palestinian issue is resolved, it will go a long ways. Uh, but, uh, b but I think there are other issues, uh, and I think one of the other issues has been the role of the Soviet Union, and hopefully that is changing. I think we have time for perhaps one or two uh, written questions. Uh, we have many, many good ones, and it's hard to choose, but I'll start out here. What are the chances of seeing an independent Palestinian state within five years? Please put a probability number on it. <laughs> and then I think you've already got into this. Would this solve the Middle East problem? Well, I think that this is a critical and crucial year. Um, I think the Palestinians believe that the peace talks and uh, uh, the process is, uh, well, uh, it's been very slow. Uh, a slug is uh, seen as a silver streak almost compared to the process that's occurred in bringing uh, uh, any kind of uh, peace talks into being. And uh, if something doesn't happen dramatically in this now a year and uh, three months after the beginning of four months, after the beginning of the Intifada, uh, I think that we're going to see much greater escalation of the problem because uh, as the Israeli soldiers become more and more repressive just over the weekend, four more deaths. Almost every day now we read in the newspapers and see on television more people killed, more brutalization. As, as that escalates more and more, we're going to see uh, a hardening of the attitudes and a hardening of the positions. We were in a daycare camp uh, there in Gaza Strip and I, these were some of the pictures that uh, were drawn by the youngsters they, there at the daycare center. And they show scene after scene after scene of, of violence and stones and death and destruction. And these kids are three, four, five, and six-year-old uh, children. And uh, we're seeing the systematic uh, brutalization of society both in terms of the Israeli and in terms of the Palestinians. And as that continues and continues, we're going to see, I think, a, a, a hardening of the attitudes, a more escalation of the violence, and so forth. So I think this is a critical year. Uh, 